We're awake. We're alive. Praise God. We're ready to go. I have to tell you, it's hard to hide excitement. And my, my wife is so excited that we came out here this, this particular weekend. And not just because I get to come up here and edify the saints, but because she got to spend time with Mrs. Wilson, who has pampered us from the time that we have set foot out of the airplane. So I want to give thanks to Mrs. Wilson for all the accommodations. So thank you very much. Uh, this morning, uh, when we talk about excitement, I have to share this story because we're on the eve of, I know all of you kids right now are thinking about it. School is coming up next week. How exciting. Kids, <laughs> contain yourselves. <laughs> huh? But I remember particularly this one student my first year. His name was Evan Conley. And I told the class, I said, we're going to do some oral presentations. And I said, so get ready. You're going to get up on your feet, learn how to present information, and we're going to take it from there. And this uh, little six-year-old, he was super excited. At the end of the day, he runs up to his mom. He said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. We get to do Oreo presentations. <laughs> it's all in how you look at things, isn't it? But you never know what's going to come out of the mouth of eight and nine-year-olds. Last, last year, we took a group to Kosai, uh, which is in Columbus, and uh, kind of a neat place to take kids, scientific information. But uh, this one particular eight-year-old was in the back of my vehicle, and I had three of them. And I own a 20-year-old Buick LeSabre. It's a classic, so you just got to understand that, first and foremost. And the eight-year-old blurts out from the back, Mr. McGraw, he said, this is a nice car. I get the rear view mirror out, and I'm looking. I, is this guy pulling my chain here? So just about then, I feel kind of pretty good about the car. I chest starting to go out a little bit, and he says, I've never been in an old-fashioned car before. <laughs> Thank you, Baden. Thank you. That was very kind of you to say. You know you've arrived on the old scene when you drive an old Buick, but that's the way it goes. Let's uh, open our Bibles this morning to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We'll pick it up in verse 27. Obviously, Jesus has made an impact with the Samaritan woman, has changed her life, and now he is uh, pointing his direction elsewhere. Verse 27, it says, And at this point his disciples came, and they marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot, went into the city, and said to them, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city, and they were coming to him. In the meanwhile, the disciples were requesting him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples therefore were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who re reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in the case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored. You have entered into their labor. Let's pray. Great and almighty God in heaven, Father, we give thanks to you for the breath of life this morning that we're able to come here and to function as a body. Father, to be edified and encouraged and to encourage each other. Thank you for the life, which, Father, is the light of men, that we get to be able to, uh, Father, have that unapproachable light dwell within us, that we become the illuminaries, the the light that sits, Father, upon a hillside, that cast upon uh, the world, Father, the truth in its entirety, Father, not only through word but through deed. 
Lord, I thank you that we have this weekend to be strengthened, that we can be the type of people that, uh, Father, uh, that you can be proud of us, Lord, in ways that, um, as you said, that we would do the greater works. So, Lord, this morning, bless my tongue. May the words be spoken, be rightly divided, and uh, may they be impactful, inspiring to get the saints moving uh, for your work, Father. And I just uh, pray these things in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen. I'm only going to really take a couple verses out of the passage that I just read. And I think the first one that we have to deal with really comes in verse 34. He said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Verse 35 says, Do not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. I think in order for us to really answer that question, to look on the fields is really the point that I'm going to ask you to do this morning. When you look on the fields, I think it's imperative that we have to look at it with the proper understanding. And the proper understanding is, how do you consider Jesus? Because how you look at him is how you're going to look at those fields. Anything less than Jesus and glory is going to cause you to have less of a viewpoint that's going to be able to take a look at this in its entirety to be able to finish the harvest the way Jesus expects his army, his resurrected army, to do that. Turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. The question is, how do you view Jesus? If you can answer that question, then how you look upon those fields will ultimately um, determine the course of when you enter in that harvest, laboring and reaping. So it says here in verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. And that's what I want you to do this morning is to consider Jesus. Some religions obviously are going to look at Jesus in a historical manner, the death, burial, and resurrection. No more, no less. Some people are going to look at Jesus as a nice teacher, the rabbi, and uh, they would be correct to a certain extent. But if you're really going to consider Jesus, you're going to have to consider Jesus, as the Hebrew writer says, as the apostle and high priest of our confession. If we're working with people, if we're really interested in getting into the harvest, you're only going to go as far as how you consider Jesus. If you consider Jesus as a good teacher, got some good principles, then that's about what you're going to have to offer people when you enter into that harvest. If you look at Jesus from just an historical point of view, um, recorded down black and white letters, that's what you have to offer people. But if you really consider Jesus, the one who ascended to glory, made purifications of sins, sat down to the right hand of the Father, declared both Lord and Christ, he is Jehovah God. If you look at him from that proper position, then you're going to view the harvest in a completely different way. That's the only way to look at the harvest. Anything less will fall short of the expectation that God has for his people. Looking at Jesus from the wrong point of view... Is a, is a disadvantage for us as the, res, as the resurrected army. A disadvantage of us looking at things from a wrong viewpoint is not profitable as a whole. Hebrews chapter 2, 2 says, He was faithful to him who appointed him. He was faithful. Faithful in what respect? Well, you got to go back and really read Hebrews chapter 2, because chapter 3 opens up, therefore. So what is chapter 2 talking about, that we would have to consider Jesus? We have to consider Jesus from the context of 2. What did he do that we would have to consider? Well, let's just read a few verses here. 
And verse 10 says, It was fitting for him from whom all things, through whom all thi- or, are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author, the salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim thy name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing thy praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same. Through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brother in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, making propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those that are tempted." I would consider Jesus from that point of view. This is the guy that was able to take death in the name of Satan and just level him with one clean swoop through his resurrection. That's the Jesus that we have to consider this morning. The one that is able to come to the aid of those that are descendants of Abraham by faith. That's the one that we have to consider. See, anything less that we read out of this, we make any other consideration, anything other than this, and we won't get the proper viewpoint of who Jesus is. It's imperative that we look, and I know it will sound like a, um, that we're going to say it over and, and, and over again this weekend, but Jesus in glory. It's the only thing that will motivate a person, giving the proper context of being able to see the harvest for what it is. I want to consider the Jesus that has been tempted in all ways, partook of flesh and blood, been there, done that, been able to really be harassed and harangued and yet keep his mind clear, clean, been able to walk, you know, when, when things got tough, been able to lead the example for, for, for his men, for the 12 that, that followed him. That's the one that I want to consider. Hebrews 3, 6 goes on to say this, For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, but a testimony for those things which were to be spoken later. For Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast to our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Bill, do you need your eggs back? They're, yeah, they're still under. The, no, I'm fine. I, okay. I haven't eaten yet, and I. It's just. The proper viewpoint of Jesus. Now it's the proper viewpoint of us. And so, Second Corinthians five seventeen says this, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as through God or at, I'm sorry as through God or as though God were entreating 
I'm going to start over in verse 20. Therefore we, as ba- uh, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I thought about what Mr. Sutton said last night, so I added this point, and I thought it was fitting that sometimes when we're looking at the new creature, we can't elevate the new creature so that we become, in a sense, worshiping the new creature. And here's the challenge, guys, that part of becoming a new creature, beholding those new things, laying aside the old things, there's a There's a ministry of reconciliation that comes with that new creature. There's a responsibility that comes with that. When it says there in verse 18, now all these things are from God. One of the things that God gives us is the opportunity to be a part of that ministry of reconciliation. Any form of detachment from that, see, doesn't serve the purpose of being a new creature in Christ. It's hard to, to park that or to let go of it and yet still have that identity of being a new creature. You can't have one without the other. So the viewpoint of yourself when you enter into that harvest has to be a new creation. When you woke up this morning, were you a new creation? Yes or no? Amen. You were a new creation. Clean slate, clean conscience. The inner man being empowered empowered to do something that the religion can't do out there. And the difference is, if we park this part of it, if we decide that the ministry of reconciliation is not going to be a part of who I am as a new creation, then we're no different from them out there. Then it becomes a social club in some aspect. And the social side of, of, of Christ's church is great. We get to come and encourage and be encouraged and do all of those great things. But it has to be far more than that. There's something that Mr. Wilson said a long time ago that I've never forgotten. And this is the difference of what uh, Christ church is. His church. This is it. Who can take the man off the street? Empower him. Make him walk by faith. Give him the new creation principles to live by, to overcome. And then have that man take the, the next man off the street. Who can do that? The ministry of reconciliation, if we're looking at the harvest from the right viewpoint, we have to look at ourselves from that, saying, I am a new creation, wired, empowered, to be able to take the guy off the street and do the same thing that somebody did for me. You don't have to have... Specifically, a Bible study. Line one up. Be a part of one. There's all different ways that you can be a part of this. Be a prayer warrior for those that are engaged in those Bible studies. Be a prayer warrior for the open doors for those to, to walk through, to engage those that are looking for truth. But I'm telling you, you, you park this aside, and we're no different from those guys out there. That's how important being a new creation in Christ is, is attaching yourself to the ministry of reconciliation. It's going to save you. And I know that's hard to fathom. But stop and think about that. Somebody saved you in the process of you looking for truth. As soon as I detach myself from that, I've made myself as Phil Sutton says, the creature that's supposed to be worshipped in some aspect. That's important, I think, that we stop and contemplate this morning. Am I more important at this point in my life or is somebody out there? When I think about it, my best friend is out there somewhere. He's out there waiting for me to embrace him with the truth. He doesn't know me yet. But they're out there. You stop and think about the people that you have in front of you. All of the relationships. All of the solid ones that you have in Christ. And they're a blessing in your life, aren't they? 
There's more out there. It's hard to think that there's somebody like Mr. Harbor out there that could wear a shirt like this in here this morning. It is hard to pull that off, isn't it? But he, he does it. Look at Jesus. Consider him. Consider what he did. Look at him from the proper viewpoint. And then consider yourselves. How do you see yourself as a new creation? Plugged in, wired, ready to be empowered, and ready to help other people to be empowered. That's the viewpoint you got to have if you're going to take a good look. When Jesus says, lift up your eyes and look at the harvest, that's what we got to be looking through. Those lenses, those viewpoints. And in verse 35 of John, he says, do not say there are yet four months. Or he said, did you not say yet there are four months? we got to remove that verbatim from our, from our vocabulary. You know, time is important. I'm 50 years old. Jim Derry said at 50, I'll know everything I need to know. Problem is, I can't remember half of it by the time I get to 50. <laughs> right, Matt? <laughs> Sorry, did you forget? You... Uh, okay, great. <laughs> when is salvation? Today, now, today is the day of salvation. Not four months, not tomorrow, not next week. Foot on the pedal. And I know it takes a sense of urgency, a, a, a sense of energy. You, you got to be able to bring that every day to the table. And I appreciate what Matt said last night. Sometimes that's the truth. Your feet hurt, your back's tired, your mind's tired, you've been in the school working all day, and you got to go right back out the door, and you got to put on the smiley face because you got to let people know that they're the most important part of your life at that point and moment. And you got to turn it on. If you got to fake it till you make it, that's all right too, but you got to do it. So when we're talking about four months, we don't have four months. You know, if we're looking at things the right way, it is now. And so remove that. It's toxic. And if the saints are going to get the work done, we got to say now. That has to be the word you has to, have to substitute, now. Now, do we have any professional gamblers in the assembly today? Are, Mike? Okay. Didn't expect that. <laughs> that was threw me for a loop here. Well, you've come to the right place, Mike. But let me share something. My father, who has been a Christian for 14 years, but he was borderline professional gambler. And I say that, that he wasn't a guy that Wasted money, didn't have money to pay the bills and all that. But as a professional gambler, if you have any insight into professional gambling, it's not something you do with your heart. It's something you do with the mind. It, it's a, it, I don't want to call it an elaborate form of handicapping, but there's a lot that goes into it. And so years ago, there was something that my dad and I used to do. You know, we're on the brink of college football season. They're going to allow Michigan to play today. Um, and uh, they play some, some team down south, Florida. It's supposed to be a decent game. But here's how it works. Vegas comes out with the, with the betting line every week. And they got the line particularly put where they can get action. That's just the way it works. So when they get the line just right and the action starts coming from both sides, then, then they know they got the point spread right. But if you're a professional gambler, you never look at the Las Vegas lines ever do you do that you make your own line that's how it works so if you're looking at 30 ball games today you are making your own point spread sheet because you're handicapping the advantages disadvantages that's just how professional gamblers do it so when you get your point spread lined out then you go get vegas's point spread 
Why do you do that? Because you are looking for the anomaly that Las Vegas has missed something along the lines of getting a point spread wrong. And you're talking about a point spread one, two, three points sometimes, and Vegas does get it wrong sometimes. You're saying, why do you know so much about this? <laughs> years ago, trust me, years ago. But when they get it wrong, professional gamblers are on it like sharks. And they smell blood in the water. And they will lay as much action as they can until that point spread starts moving in the right direction. That's just how it works. So my dad and I used to play a little game. We used to write our own point spreads, and then we used to compare it with Vegas to see who was the smarter guy as far as handicapping. That's just the way you did it. You had to prove. You had to be able to see the advantages and the disadvantages in every team. That was the only way. You couldn't rely on anybody else to tell you where the point spread. You figured it out. So why am I bringing this up? It's time for you to handicap. The word handicap is a simple term. Old horse racing, you put some, some uh, numbers in a hat. You put the hand in the cap and draw it out. Handy cap, get it? It's true, I didn't make that up. All right. But you have to handicap yourself. Where do you see yourself in this harvest? You got to lay out the advantages and the disadvantages. The two points I brought up is where do you consider Jesus or how do you consider him? What viewpoint? And how do you consider yourself as a new creation? A real better, the one that's honest. See, bets right here with his head. How are you handicapping yourself? So I'm going to tell you how Jesus handicaps his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church divine. See, he sees a winner in you, whether you see it or not yet. He sees you having the ability to go into the harvest and drag those from the fire. Head or foot, it doesn't matter how we bring them, as long as they're willing. Jesus sees a winner. The challenge is, how do you view yourself? How do you handicap? Have you placed the mind in the proper position to say, I can do this? And sometimes we set ourselves up for failure. Sometimes we handicap ourselves the way we say we just make an excuse here or there of why we can't get out into the harvest. Jesus can pick a winner, and he knows a winner. Verse 36 of John chapter 5. John chapter 4, I apologize. John 4:36. 4, Four thirty six reads, Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. I just want to take a snapshot of, and define what labor is. Labor is not taking the shovel and going out in the backyard and digging a hole with a little bit of sweat equity. This labor, if you look it up in the Greek, it is intense. It's intense, guys. It's hardships. It's sorrow. It's fatigue. It's toil. It's pain. You got to be a tough hombre to be able to enter this race. You go into that field, you better be ready. You better bring it.
This field will break a lot of men because they thought that they entered into some type of covenant that was some type of mamby pamby willy nilly covenant. This is a man's covenant. And respect it, you're going to have to man up. Act like a man, be a man, think like a man, put away the childish things, put away the Xboxes, guys. Those are toys. I don't get it. Put away the technology. Go get a Bible study. Man up. You enter in that harvest. It's time to man up. It's not a boys game. We're talking about life and death. Eternal life. Just as Mr. Wilson says, eternal death lasts just as long. Labor. Appreciate what Brother Sutton said last night about John the Immerser. He knew his position. He accepted it. He took on that role fully, and he focused on the finished. Slight paraphrase there. But he did his job. He knew his role. And there in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus receives news that John was beheaded, he went off to a lonely place. And I wonder what Jesus was, was thinking about, the forerunner there. Well, I know you, and this is conjecture on my part, but if I was Jesus, I would have praised God for the team player that John was, for stepping up and being the kind of man that it took to be the forerunner for the Lord of Lords. Praising God for raising up a faithful man who understood his position and his role, never wavering in that commitment. Praising God that he never lost sight of himself, being nothing more than a messenger of hope for those that would listen. And praising God that John never lost focus of his true mission, which was to go and proclaim the coming kingdom. And Jesus was praising God that John never confused the messenger as being more important than the message. Never got that twisted around. And you enter into that harvest, when you lift up your eyes and you see those that are in darkness, one thing that you're going to have to really consider is, who's more important, me or the message? Now, I often think about Paul there in Acts chapter 20, only thing that he could give those guys when he, when he departed and left and they hugged and cried. What did he say? I commend you to the word of God. That's it. Not commending you to myself or my ministry, but to the word, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance. That's it. The word, the message is far greater than us, the messenger. John was the ultimate team player. When I entered into the kingdom 15 years ago, I saw things that I didn't think were possible. I didn't know that they were real. And by, by entering into the kingdom, your eyes are open. And I got to see men firsthand be able to, to do things that you know just weren't natural. One of the first experiences I had was watching Mr. Harbor drive clear across country as he's driving the youths out west to the youth camp. And here was an evangelist, a leader of his congregation, fiery guy, well thought out, well spoken. And what job does Mr. Wilson, Matt Wilson, give him? He's cleaning toilets all week. And he cleans it with such... It was way too much comment, by the way. <laughs> we went through more comment that week than I think was possible, but... I'm starting to think, who, who does these things? People that are interested in entering into that harvest and laboring, sowing, 
and reaping for all of the right reasons. Checking the ego at the door. Not about me, it's about the message. I think about men over the years. Because anybody that's here, here today, here this morning, you have entered into somebody else's labor. You cannot get away from that. You've stepped right into it one way or another. Do you know how Christ Church Ministry was started 15 years ago, 16 years ago? A cassette tape and five booklets. The first guy I ever heard was Larry Gall preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? And he was rumbling like Larry does, right? Man, it was, it was liberating to hear that a guy like me who had nothing going for him at the time could overcome sin. It was an amazing message. A cassette tape in the bottom of a basement of Jim's house in five booklets. That's what we entered into. But you know what kind of labor it took for those five booklets and that tape to make it 2,000 miles back to Lancaster, Ohio? There was some intensive labor inside the congregations of Montana. Intensive. And we stepped right into that labor. And we get the reap from that. Immediately, we get the reap. Who else gets to do that? How does God set that up that way? I've never gotten paid immediately when I started working. But the minute that I stepped into Christ, I started reaping the benefits from somebody else's labor. From the hardships, from the fatigue, from the toil, from the sweat equity that they poured in to Christ's church, his body. When you're talking about parking egos, my daughter told me when she got back from Belarus, she was, Daddy, it's, it's awful. You know, the conditions, you know, some of the oppression, the things that go on. But I always appreciate what Mr. Compton did for her and for the example that he set. How many people are going to try to take the gospel over to Belarus? And some of the things that you have to do in order to get doors open to get the truth out there. But she told me that he had to paint the inside of a four-stall outhouse that was filled to the brim. And the smell was unreal. But those are the types of things that Mr. Compton is interested in doing in order for the truth, in order for his eyes, when he looks at that harvest, he looks at it from the right perspective. That he's willing to do those things to set example for the young people to know that this is the type of stuff that's going to have to happen in order for the message to get out. And you know what he did? He did it with all joy, with a great attitude. Did you have a four-inch brush, by the way? Good. Good. At least it wasn't a trim brush, right? It might have been in there a little longer. But I'm amazed that when we look at things from the right perspective, the things that we're willing to do to save a soul. I'm appreciative. Have I got five minutes? Okay. I am super appreciative of the congregations in Montana. I, I don't know if you can... Actually, you, you almost have to stand back from my point of view. Fifteen years ago, you know, when you're talking about starting a congregation and getting a hold of the truth, you guys had to enter into that labor long before we did. And we got to reap from that. The guys that I can sit here and just call out one after another. You have no idea how important it was for those messages to be recorded or, you know, to be listened to. I heard, I heard guys like Tom Tuck and Mr. Brenner. And, uh, you know, I can go on and on if I, if I can see their faces out through there. But guys that I can hear their voice 
15 years ago that their faith was real and that their wisdom and knowledge was coming back through those cassette tapes. See, they added to my faith and they added to the faith of others that listened. See, we entered into your labor. See, it was worth it. See, we reaped from your hardships for those years. I entered into the classroom of the Zeshes the other day. I just didn't see desks that were freshly painted. I saw toil and hardship and sweat equity that was poured into those schools. We couldn't have entered into that without somebody entering into that labor first. Thank you, Mrs. Zesh. Got the job done. 28 kids in that little classroom. Great attitude, great example. That helps guys like me and whoever else entered into that field. Showed me I could get it done too. Are you willing to set foot in that field to let somebody else see your example? Willing to go through some hardships, willing to have the right attitude and to get the job done. Christ is interested in those types of people. Are you going to allow somebody to enter into your labor for King Jesus? That's the question. Is it worth it? Every step of the way. All the way to glory, is it worth it? Are you ready to get into the field? Are you ready? Praise God. Let's go.